you read through the entire Bible in 2017, please let me know. Please see me after the service so that I can prepare your annual certificate. That's something that has been done here in this church for many, 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 many years. Everyone who reads through the entire Bible in one year uh, gets a special certificate. So please let me know so that we can prepare your certificate for next Sunday. Now please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Exodus, where we were just a few moments ago reading in our scripture reading. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. Bitter waters and sweet, Naomi in the desert, part 13. We've been studying in our current text Israel's rebellions during the wilderness wanderings. And we've been discussing what God does when people rebel against his ordained leadership as well as when they rebel against him directly. So far we've seen that there are at least 12 principles that God has set out in the Bible for dealing with group rebellion and we've studied principles number 1 through 10 uh, at this point. So Exodus chapter 15 verses 22 and following. We saw last week, or last time that we were together, last week of course was Christmas with the unspeakable gift, but the last time we were together back in December 17th, we looked at principle number 10, that when God judges it's no small matter. He makes his point in ways that even stupid people can understand, and we saw the rather striking number of deaths that were killed in the plague besides the matter of Korah in Numbers chapter 16. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700, beside them which died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. And as we looked at that passage two weeks ago, we saw that rebellion appears to be a very common occurrence among God's people, even down to the present time. In fact, rebellion is almost doing business as usual in the overall context of congregations of believers. We had several illustrations of that principle, God judging rebellious individuals, rebellious subordinate leaders, rebellious congregations in the New Testament. We saw rebellion against Paul. We saw rebellion against John. Uh, we saw that principles number 11 and 12, uh, which we have not yet covered, will be covered a little bit later on. But last time, we looked at Naomi in the Desert, part 12, at Mara. So Moses brought up Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. We're sort of an instantaneous microwave oven kind of people, and we can't wait for anything. We stand in front of the microwave and say, hurry up, hurry up, come on, hurry up, hurry up, <laughs> because we want it now. We don't want it later. We want it now. And three days, can you imagine going three days without water? and thinking either God doesn't know what he's doing or Moses doesn't know what he's doing, and the pillar of cloud and fire is leading them through the wilderness, and they start to rebel against Moses. They say, Moses, you should know better than this. Uh, after all, you were a shepherd here in the wilderness for all these years. You ought to know where there's some good water. How come we don't have any water? And they begin to rebel against Moses, and they call the name of the place that they find Mara because it has bitter waters. And we saw that Mara, meaning bitter, is actually the name that Naomi gave to herself in Ruth chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, and she accuses God. Rather interesting because we see a parallel between that and what's going on with the children of Israel in the wilderness. Naomi comes back to Bethlehem. Her name Naomi means pleasant, but she says, Call me Mara, that means bitter, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitter, bitterly with me. That was complaint number one. Complaint number two, the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Complaint number three, the Lord hath testified against me. Complaint number four, the Almighty hath afflicted me. Blaming God. Have we ever been in situations of bitterness in our lives? Things just didn't work out the way we thought they were going to work out, and suddenly we become bitter against God. It's a very great danger, and God's people are very often in that situation. Naomi, in her pain, blamed God for the problem that she faced. She clearly understood the sovereignty of God. You know, you can be a good, solid Presbyterian, understand the sovereignty of God, and still have bitterness in your spirit against God. Naomi understood that God 
was in charge. God's the one who had brought the famine to the land. Naomi's husband had dragged the whole family down to Moab. Naomi understands that God took away her husband and her two sons. And yet she's bitter against God because she understands the sovereignty of God. Understanding that, we need to understand the balancing half of the sovereignty of God. And Paul explains that, of course, for us in Romans chapter 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God has purpose in the difficult things that he lets come into our lives. God has reasons for everything that happens. There is nothing that escapes not only his purview, but his direction and his hand of grace and love and gentleness and kindness. We think we deserve something. That's why we gripe when God does something in our lives that we don't like. But God does everything according to his love for us. There's a God in heaven who loves us. He never does anything out of spitefulness. He's never capricious in the way that he deals with our lives. So we need to resist the temptation that Naomi fell into and later saw the gracious hand of God when all the women of, of the city, you know, communed together and they said, you know, the daughter-in-law that God has given you is better than seven sons. If you had seven sons, they wouldn't take as good a care of you as your daughter-in-law has taken care of you. Too often we're looking toward other people to care for us and we're looking to the wrong people to care for us. Instead of realizing God may have somebody specially brought into our lives to meet needs that we thought we had, but in a different way than we thought those needs would be met. Ah, to learn thanksgiving for the difficult times of life because God is teaching us lessons through those difficult times of life. Joseph understood it. We talked about Joseph. Joseph was hated by his brothers. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold as a slave by his brothers. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He spent years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. Then he was miraculously delivered and achieved incredible, powerful status, number two in all of Egypt, at its height. And he had the opportunity to get revenge on those rascals that had made him go through all that suffering. And most of us would have been bitter. Instead, Joseph understood the sovereignty of God in that, but he also understood the mercy of God in that. God was refining and developing the character of Joseph. And so Joseph was able, as he revealed himself to his brothers, and his brothers were terrified, he said, But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Joseph understood the sovereignty of God because the sovereignty of God is irreducibly linked to the love and compassion and mercy of God for his people. Don't just look at one half of the sovereignty of God, which is his power. Look at the way in which it is inextricably joined together with the rest of his character, which is designed for your good as well as for his glory. Job understood it. But he knoweth the way that I take, for when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So when you're going through a time of pain, when you're going through a time of suffering, don't blame God out of a bitter spirit. Instead, thank him with humility. He decide, designed those difficult times for your good and for your spiritual growth. We saw that over in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and following, and the Holy Spirit himself bears witness with that. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 
God works all things according to the counsel of his will, and he works them for our good, as well as his glory. So Naomi is very much like us. She responded with bitterness in her suffering. She couldn't take her eyes off earth and look up to heaven with praise and thanksgiving because Naomi didn't know the future. And you and I, we know a lot more about the future than Naomi did. We have all these incredible promises, not only of the Old Testament, most of which hadn't been written when Naomi was alive. I mean, she, she lived in the days of the judges, which means most of the Old Testament had not yet been written. So she didn't see all those grand prophetic things that were yet to come. She certainly wasn't alive at the time that the New Testament was written. You and I have no excuse for becoming bitter, becoming gloomy, becoming sorrowful because of what we think we're going through because we have the great and precious promises and those promises include the fact that we are heirs with Christ Jesus of all things in the heavenlies and in glory. Keep your eyes looking up. The story is told of a man who was walking down the street one day and uh, he glanced down and he saw a penny down on the ground and he was excited. He picked it up and put it in his pocket. And then he thought, well, there may be more. And so he spent all the rest of his life looking at dirt, looking at dirt, looking for pennies and missing the glories of the spring, missing the glories of the flowers, missing the glories of God's creation around him, missing the glories of looking up at a starlit night because he spent his time looking at dirt, hoping he'd find a penny. Too many of us are like that. We have the scriptures which give to us an exposition of things to come, of glories, humongous glories in the heavens that are ours. And with joy we can tell others how they can know Jesus also and get those glories for themselves. Bitterness will destroy you. Bitterness will keep you from what God has in goodness in store for you. Naomi had a husband who'd rebelled. He'd left the promised land. Her husband died, her sons died. She was in danger of losing her land and inheritance because she'd been gone so long she had no money. She had no strength because she was getting older. One of her daughters-in-law left her to go back to paganism. That would be a discouragement. She was returning to Bethlehem not because of religious conviction, but she heard a rumor that there was food there. Her stomach made her go home. How often are we motivated by things like that? But she still was not happy with God. She still had no idea what goodness God had by drawing her back to Bethlehem and giving her one daughter-in-law who was not even Jewish, who was a Moabitess. And the Moabitess could not come into the congregation of the Lord for four generations. If a Moabitess or a Moab, a Moabite, trusted in the God of Israel, they were not allowed to actually become a part of the congregation of Israel for four generations. Did you know David is the fourth generation after Ruth? God, in his sovereign wisdom, is a God of grace and mercy. The greatest king other than King Jesus himself is David HaMelech, David the king. Remember that when you're suffering. God is a God of grace and mercy. And you do not yet know what goodness he has in store for you in the days to come. Pain comes into our lives because God wants us to learn to trust him instead of learning to trust something else. We always want to know what's plan B. We always want to know what is the alternative to the road that I'm taking right now in case the road has some bumps in it. How can I step off on a different road that's going to be smoother? We always want that plan B. But 
God tells us to walk by faith down the road that he's called us to. Because that road is essential to the productive, joyful Christian life. We've talked about it before. You probably remember several sermons that I've preached on that subject. But walking portrays daily progress and accomplishment. It implies a destination. It implies a goal. It is a clear statement that the individual believer has something that he believes to be true even though his eye cannot see it. And he proves that by walking by faith in confidence toward the goal that he cannot yet see. If you can see it, it's not walking by faith, it's walking by sight. What should we say then? That Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And the father of circumcision, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised, so Abraham was what you would have called a Gentile before God instituted circumcision, who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had, being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The walk of faith. Dear people, that's what God has called you to. And that's how Israel failed miserably here at the waters of Marah. After all, they had gone three days without water. And when they finally got to the water, it wasn't, it wasn't drinkable. And so they screamed and yelled at Moses and thus screamed and yelled against God. They're saying, well, Lord, you've brought us here. We're going to wait patiently for your solution. We would have been tempted to do the same thing. <laughs> I suspect... Even today, at least some of us, if we had been in that situation, even if today we had, as we do, the indwelling Holy Spirit, all the promises of God that we right now have in the Bible, if we had come to that exact same point as Israel did, I suspect there would have been some discontent, <laughs> at the very least, with what is God doing in our lives why do we have to go through this? I mean, this is crazy. God himself is leading us into the wilderness, but we're also following a man. We can't see God, but we can see him. And you know what? We don't like what we're experiencing. It fits us very, very well. We know the passage in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's not what you can see. They were focusing on the thing that they could see, which was Moses on the thing that they could see, which was bitter water, on the thing which they could see around them, which was desert, instead of trusting the living God, because he brought them out of Egypt. If he wants them to live, he can give them water. And if he wants them to die, he doesn't have to do that. He can kill them all instantly, as we saw when he killed those people in the plague. 14,700 of them with Korah and his company, 250 there, plus the others, Nadab and Abihu. Huh, you know what? That's 15,000 people. And he can kill them like that in maybe a span of two minutes as the plague begins to roll across the people and they're dropping like flies and Aaron is racing at top speed to get ahead of the plague and he up the golden censer and the plague stops. And he stands between the dead and the living. People, we're here in the text. And significant to all of that, that passage about walking by faith and not walking by sight is a context of heaven and heavenly rewards. You may not 
lose your physical life like did the children of Israel here, but daily, and you haven't even gotten to number 10 yet, daily you are losing heavenly rewards which you will weep for when you get to heaven. There are tears in heaven. It says so in the book of Revelation. If you come Sunday evenings, we'll be studying that in detail. Because God's going to have to wipe away all tears from their eyes. There are tears in heaven all the way through the millennium. And the rapture and the heavenly rewards have already been given at the Bema seat during the wedding of the Lamb in heaven while tribulation is going on on earth. And there are going to be people who saw what they could have gotten and they didn't because their works were not works of faith and they're burned up. Don't throw it away. Don't throw it away. The judgment seat of Christ is the place where believers receive their heavenly rewards. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 3 and chapter 6 also. It's not the great white throne judgment. That's where unbelievers go. That's Revelation chapter 20 verse 11. They all appear before him and every one of them is damned and cast into hell. But the judgment seat where the rewards are given is where our works are tested by fire to determine whether it was a work of the flesh or whether or not it was a walk of faith. Failure to walk by faith is rebellion in the eyes of God because you are trusting something or someone else instead of trusting him. We see that incredible premium that God places on faith over in Hebrews 11 where he gives you a whole chapter of people who walked by faith and they didn't have anywhere near as much revelation, anywhere near as much insight, anywhere near as much freedom, anywhere near as much of scriptures that they could hold in their own hands and read with their own eyes. They didn't have it anything like you and I have today. But they were heroes of faith. And without us, they are not made perfect. And we're told very clearly, but without faith, this is verse 6, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is, oh, here we're back to rewards again, that he is the rewarder of them that sort of show up once a week and, you know, come into church and maybe spend 20 minutes in church if they happen to be on time. God or is he just sort of an afterthought and you do it because it's culturally polite and acceptable do you diligently seek God that's where you get the rewards oh dear people I love you I want so badly to rejoice with you when you stand in the presence of Christ and hear the word of God, I'm holding faithful servant. And where he calls you forward and places the Stephanos, the crown, that's the word from which we get Stephen, the victor's wreath on your head, and you receive your heavenly rewards. I want the joy of saying, I was the pastor of those people. Dear ones, I don't preach like this because I hate you. I preach like this because I love you. I want you to win. He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But if you refuse to walk by faith, it is impossible for you to please God. That's what it says. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. If you refuse to walk by faith, you cannot please God. Most of us don't believe that, and we show it by the way in which we live 
our lives. The second test at Mara was the refusal of Israel to walk by faith. You know, God still met their needs because he is faithful, even though we're not, and he had promised to bring them to the promised land. But that's one of the ten failures that God counted as rebellion. Check, check, ticking them off, one through ten, gotten through two of them. There's one, two, eight to go. Oh, we still got plenty of time. We don't have to worry about it. We'll make it there. We certainly won't rebel those eight other times. We're going to make it to the promised land. Nobody aged 20 and over except Joshua and Caleb, not even Moses himself, except Joshua and Caleb made it into the land of promise. Even if there were only two million Jews, that's one in a million. That's not very good odds. But they all made choices. They all made choices. And every day you and I make choices. Either we will walk by faith or we will walk by sight. Either we will walk in the spirit or we will walk in the flesh. And every time we walk in the flesh, we are losing heavenly rewards. And God is ticking off the numbers until the day of our death. Why do you think God spends so much time on this particular group of sins that Israel committed? In the, you know, it's not just here in Exodus. You find it in Numbers, you find it in Deuteronomy, you find references to it all the way through the Old Testament scriptures. God wants us to learn a lesson. I hope we do. When you refuse to walk by faith, even though you currently have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit, God is ticking off the chart that will result in your death and your failure to gain heavenly rewards. We're not talking about salvation or sanctification. We're talking about rewards. Remember the context? All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some he doesn't say some other thing. He says some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. You look back at those heroes of faith. Man, you see some pretty impressive stuff. You see some amazing things that God did through these heroes of faith. Do you know God has provided a better, a better, better thing for you if you walk by faith? And he adds you to that list of the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 that they without us should not be made perfect. Tell us, not made complete. The list is not complete until your name is added to it. That's exciting. So let me summarize. We've learned many lessons that are subcategories about the points of rebellion thus far for which God killed the adult Israelites in the wilderness. But the key points in God's death sentence, the first two that we've studied so far with that first long introduction, are number one, the first point of rebellion that we looked at taught multiple lessons, but the principal point of rebellion, which God counted as charge number one in his death sentence for the adult Jews, was this. Number one, rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God. That was one of the death tick-offs. They had nine more to go. Now we just looked at number two. The second point of rebellion that God counted as charge number two in his death sentence of which the adult Israelites were going to die was what we're looking at right now, which is refusing to walk by faith is rebellion against God. Those are the two, first two charges in that death penalty where God finally killed them after ten times. Walking by faith is a habitual lifestyle. This habitual lifestyle of the Christian is also called walking in the Spirit. In the past, I've talked to you about a very interesting prophetic passage out of the Old Testament that speaks of Israel as a nation. The Bible promises that in the prophetic future, Israel will walk in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon people and empowered them to accomplish specific things. He even empowered certain people in very strange ways on occasion. You remember Saul was trying to kill David. And he chased him and chased him and chased him and chased him. Finally found out he was at a certain location. So Saul himself went down. And when he got there, the sons of the prophets were coming out. And 
it says the spirit of God came upon Saul now he's in total rebellion he's total opposition to God he's trying to kill David the spirit comes upon Saul and it says he fell down and prophesied with the sons of the prophets you know where, where it is said there was a saying where, is Saul therefore one of the sons of the prophets that's not how the Holy Spirit works after the day of Pentecost on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came into the believers and remained and when you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior the Holy Spirit comes into you and remains not lots of show and all that kind of stuff that the charismatics are pushing but he comes in and takes up residence inside of you your body is now called the temple of the Holy Spirit of God and he never ever leaves you he's there when you do what is right under his motivation and when you sin and are defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit and Paul says if any man defiles the temple of God him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy which temple ye are that's why it's such a dangerous thing for a Christian to commit sin, to rebel against God, to refuse to walk by faith, to insist on walking in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit. There's coming a day when national Israel will walk in the spirit. They failed that, obviously, here in the wilderness wanderings. And as a result, that caused them to rebel against the clear commands of God. Failure to walk in the Spirit brought God's judgment and ultimately death to the adults in the days of Moses. Refusal to walk in the Spirit is also a point of rebellion that is often found in the New Testament church, and especially in American churches today. We're very much like Israel on that second point of, of rebellion. For example, we are definitely in a state of denial concerning the sovereignty of God, when we refuse to walk in the spirit instead of trying to walk in the flesh or we walk instead by sight you know you've probably heard this slogan it's a pagan slogan when it's used of God and sometimes you hear Christians say in relation to a Bible promise they say I'll believe it when I see it now you can apply that quote to unregenerate people or even to some flaky Christians yeah you know you expect him to do that yeah well I'll see that when I believe it. well that's fine but you can never apply that to God Walking in the Spirit is introduced in the Old Testament, but it is developed and expanded in the New Testament because we now have the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit of God. We're familiar with it out of Romans chapter 8, for example, in verses 1 and 4. There is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So walking by faith is parallel to walking in the Spirit. That is empowered by the Spirit of God. You can't walk by faith unless you're empowered by the Spirit of God. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Paul says it again in Galatians chapter 1, verses 16 and 25. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you are doing things that are damaging the body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, if you're doing those things, you are not walking in the flesh, you are walking, excuse me, not walking in the Spirit, you are walking in the flesh. What are you doing to your body that you know damages your body, and yet you call yourself a Christian? Oh, it can be any kind of thing. There are lots of different kinds of things that people do to damage their bodies. They don't get enough of sleep. They'll sleep for two or three hours in the night because they want to be on the internet doing all the kind of weird stuff that people do on the internet. Or maybe they drink alcohol. Or maybe they smoke. Or maybe they're into drugs. Or maybe they're into porn. Or they're all kinds of different things. Some people hurt their bodies. When you do that, you're not walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh. You're not trusting God. You're not walking by faith. And you've been called to walk by faith. You're going through difficult times. Don't do something destructive. Do something that brings glory to God. Realize that God is transforming you and conforming you to the image of Christ because he's trying to make you learn to trust him more rather than less. You think it's an impossible situation? Trust God. You think there's no way you're going to be able to make it through this? 
trust God. He lets you go through the difficult times like he did the children of Israel at the waters of Marah because he wants to make the waters sweet as he did at the waters of Marah. You must trust him. We have a God who's a God of grace. We have a God who's a God of mercy. We have a long-suffering God. He's one who puts up with us as difficult people. He's a God who's promised, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's teaching you to trust him. Don't be like Israel in the wilderness. Learn that when the hard things come into your life, to trust him. He always and only does what is for your good and for his glory. We have an amazing God. So what are the three lessons or the sub-points of rebellion that we've learned from this instance at Mara? Number one, having a bitter spirit is rebellion against God because it blames him for doing evil when he meant it for good. Number two, refusal to walk by faith and refusal to walk in the spirit is rebellion against God. Number three, refusal to accept the tests and disciplines of God with thankfulness is rebellion against God. That brings us to the third instance of rebellion at the wilderness of sin, which is over in Exodus 16, verses 1 through 3, but I think our time is pretty well up for today, so the Lord willing, we'll start that next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your goodness and your glory. We thank you, Father, for the times of difficulty that you graciously bring into our lives, because then, instead of relying on our own strength, we must rely upon you. And you graciously allow those of us who have gotten older to have those aches and pains of life. And Father, we thank you for that because it reminds us that we can't just bounce around like spring chickens or frolicking lambs. We are running out of time. We're getting older. Whether we like to admit it or not, our days are numbered. And if our Lord tarries, we will die. How much we've been reminded of that recently. We can't move as fast as we used to. We can't solve the problems ourselves. But you let us go through that, not so that we'll be angry at you that we don't have more energy and strength but so that we will learn to rely upon you instead of relying upon the flesh. Father, we pray that you will teach us to walk by faith. We pray that you'll teach us to walk in the Spirit. We pray, Father, that day by day we might walk with you in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, so that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will not fear, for you are with us. Father, make us like the heroes of faith, for without faith it is impossible to please you. And Father, through us, though we are weak and helpless, and that gives you greater glory, when we walk by faith in the power of your Spirit, it is you who can accomplish great things. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today if I can find my bulletin, is hymn number 753, Jesus is Coming Again. Amen. Let's stand to sing all the verses, 700.